Welcome back. As you can see, I got the banding on both of the tops put on. That gives us our overlap edge on the bottom. And as you can probably see, I've put some finish on. So far, what I've done is I've put on three coats of shellac and one top coat of General Finishes Armor Seal. Now, I started by sanding up through 220, lightly by hand, and then I put the first coat of shellac on, then sanded with 300 grit, put another coat, went to 400 grit sandpaper, and after my third coat, just very lightly went over it with 600 grit sandpaper, and then put one coat of the top coat finish on there. I have not done anything with the insides of the cabinets yet, just the outsides. And now what we're ready to do is to cut some square pockets in the corners of these tops to sit down over these rods, which will capture the top in place and keep it from moving around. So let me show you how we're gonna mark that out and get that done. So if you recall, we made our tops so that they were just a smidge bigger than the outside dimensions here. And now what I've done, and I'll take one of these off to show you, is I've cut some strips of cardboard. This is a thin, I would call it single ply corrugated cardboard, probably 16th of an inch or a little over in thickness. I've cut some strips, put a nice crease in them, and put them over the corners so that they overlap each of the legs. Then, when I put the top on, I won't be trying to figure out exactly where the correct location is. It should just drop down and nest down in pretty much the right location. Now to mark the underside of this as to where we're going to cut these pockets, I'm going to use an old sheetrock trick for doing the cutouts on electrical boxes. We used to take lipstick and mark the electrical outlets, then stand the plywood up and tap it right where the electrical box is and the lipstick would leave a mark on the back side of the sheetrock showing us exactly where to cut out. Now, these ends of these tubes may not be perfectly square. <laughs> I'll admit that to you right off the bat. Um, I tried to cut them as square as I could using the little homemade miter setup, if you'll recall, but they may not be perfectly square, but if we get enough of a mark there to show at least part of the location of this on all four corners, we'll be in pretty good shape. And then we can double check it by doing a little uh, measurement with the tape measure. But let's see how this works. By the way, uh, don't go get the good lipstick out of the bathroom. Buy some cheap stuff at the drugstore. It'll make your life a lot better. Okay, now we're down. So what I wanna do is just tap, 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 and hopefully we'll have some marks on the back side. And we do. This one's got, oh, you know, about half. The other ones, yeah, it looks pretty good. We're gonna be able to get our marks here with no problem. So I'm gonna do that with the other top as well, and then we'll start cutting out those pockets for these tubes. 
Okay, now we've got our lipstick marks on here and I've got a scrap of our aluminum stock and I'm gonna line this up. Now this particular mark has three sides on it, so it makes it really easy. I'm gonna line this up, make sure I've got it just as square as I can get it and hold that down and I'm going to use a Sharpie. Uh, I could use a pencil, but uh, it's on the underside of this top. Uh, if a few ink marks remain, it's really not going to matter. What I want to do is I want to get a crisp square there because I want to come back and make an X corner to corner to find the exact center point. And I'm going to do that on all of these and get this marked out and then we'll go and cut out our little cavities for these okay all right now what I'm doing is I'm just using a little scrap of wood and I'm making a mark from corner to corner in that square which is going to locate the center point of our square mark I'm going to get that done on all of these and then we'll work on digging out our little cavity here all right, now to hollow out the bulk of our cavity here for our aluminum bar stock, what I'm gonna do is use a Forstner bit. Now I've chucked up a 7 8 inch Forstner bit, which of course is a 16th of an inch bigger than the 3 quarter inch stock, but that'll only be a 32nd of an inch bigger on each side, and I think that little bit of slop there will be actually just fine. Now when you're starting a Forstner bit there is a point on that bit that sticks out below the level of the cutters just a tiny bit and if you go ahead and get that point lined up right on that X and then just press it in without the bit turning then when you turn on the bit and start to drive it in, that little divot will guide your bit and get it centered for you just perfectly. Now I've got this set, hopefully, to drill about a quarter of an inch deep. It's not critical what the absolute dimension is, it's just important that you have your depth stop set so that all these holes are exactly the same because you don't want the hole depths to be different allowing the uh, top to um, wobble I want to be as level as possible so again I'm going to get that little point lined up on the X and I'm going to press it in I'm going to make a little divot there and that will guide the bit and get it centered as I drill my hole. And just go down to the stop. Those chips out of there. Well, I guess it goes without saying that uh, you want a good sharp chisel to uh, square up these corners, but uh, a sharp chisel is incredibly important on plywood because um, if your chisel isn't really sharp, it'll wind up just crushing the fibers of the individual layers in the plywood and you won't get good, clean, sharp cuts. And after you get your uh, corner sort of marked out, you should be able to just shave right down through it. 
if your uh, chisel isn't shaving, it's not sharp enough. All I'm doing is marking out the corners and then just shaving straight down to the level that was established by the drill bit. And easy does it. Don't need a mallet because you're not hitting this hard. As long as your chisel is sharp, you're just tapping it down and going straight in. And remember, we're not making dovetails here. Okay. And now I can just really shave and square this so I can see exactly what I'm doing. That looks pretty good. Okay, I've got one of the tops on here situated and I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I've got almost no wiggle at all and absolutely no wobble. Now, you know the difference between wiggle and wobble. Wiggle would be a little bit of side to side or back to front movement. Uh, there's really not any of that, but wobble would be terrible. That would be movement like that. We really don't want any wobble. And this looks pretty good. And I like the way this came out here with this little bit of reveal. This, uh, I think, is going to look pretty good. Let's see how the other one is fitting on. <clears throat> I haven't tested this one yet, so... We'll see how it fits. There we go. Ah, no wiggle and no wobble. Okay, I'm really happy with this. So now the next step is to work on mounting our roller bearing balls on one of these tops that we can use as an in feed or out feed table. It's going to allow us to roll our material on and off with ease. So let's figure out how we're going to mount these accurately and nicely on the top and we're just about done. All right, well, I obsessed a fair bit over the layout of these roller bearings, these conveyor bearings, and how I wanted to lay them out on the top. What I finally did was I took a piece of thin poster board and I drew in the outline of the top, and then I made a grid pattern on here and figured out the layout of these bearings. Now, the key to this Using it as an in-feed, not real critical, but using it as an out-feed, you don't want a small board to catch anywhere. You want to have a fairly contiguous beginning to where the board enters the top so that it doesn't stick on anything and it rolls through smoothly. So this is basically what the layout is going to look like. And... To top it off, we have this little bubble level, and I'm going to put that dead center in the middle. Now, I have marked all of the hole locations for pilot holes, and I'm going to just drill some real shallow pilot holes to start with, and then we'll screw all these in. Now, there's a total of 30 of these roller bearings two screws each, so a total of 60 screws. It's going to take a few minutes, um, but I'll show you how I'm going to lay this out on the top and get this, uh, get this situated. All right, so now I've got my template laid out on top of the top that I choose to use for the roller bearings. And this, the way the top will be oriented on the cabinet, this will be the front where the drawers and, and the door is and this will be the back of the cabinet. So I'm just drilling small pilot holes 
and I'm not uh, going too deep here. These are really more for the positioning of the screws than they are for actual pilot holes. The wood screws will go into this plywood with no problem anyway, but this will really help with the positioning and make it faster to screw in all these bearings. So I'm going to go ahead and get these uh, pilot holes drilled and uh, then we'll come back and I'll show you how they mount and we'll be ready for the next step. All right, just finishing up here. Uh, a lot of screws to put in. I uh, saw a guy the other day on a video just railing against magnetic screwdriver tips. And I understand some of his points, but for a job like this, this Festool magnetic driver is really a time saver. All right. So that's our roller top that we'll be using. I still need to mount my little level right here, but uh, let's just take a look. Yeah, that's going to be nice. And the nice thing about these bearings is that even if you're a little off level, when this comes in, the bearing is sticking up above the housing. So it'll grab it and roll right across. This is going to be just fine. All right, it's time now to mount these decorative metal plates over these grooves. And I'll show you what I did. The first thing that I did was I raised up uh, one of the channels here and just put some tape on it to hold it up. And that's so that I could see the bottom of the channel and the top of the channel and get them lined up. And then I lined it up the best I could and put some blue painter's tape on there just to hold it in place. And once I got that in place, I put a hand clamp on it so that it wouldn't move. Now, if you don't have these, you should definitely get some. These are called auger gimlets. And when you've got a screw hole where you really want to make sure that you get the placement just perfect, there's just nothing quite like doing this by hand. And what this does is this threads in and kind of like taps the wood for the screw that you're going to put in. So what you want to do is back that out just like you would back out a screw. And we'll go ahead and do this other one. And the neat thing about this is it has a very, very sharp point. So you can get that point and center it in your hole by eye and then just start threading it in and it will go in pretty easy and once you get it started use this little handle here on the end and just turn it in and it'll eject chips almost like a drill bit and it'll kind of like thread that wood a little bit and then back that out and then of course since we went to the trouble to paint these screws and get a nice looking finish here I'm just using an old toothbrush to knock off those surface chips so none get caught under the head of the screw and then another tip if you don't have a set of grace screwdrivers um, give yourself a treat buy yourself a set of these because they are actually the best screwdrivers on the market and we just want to go in nice and slow and get that tightened up and give us a nice pretty finish there so we'll go ahead and put the other one in.
And the nice thing about the auger gimlet, uh, drill bit, when you start a drill bit in, even a good brad point bit, it is possible for that bit to dance a little bit on the surface. The auger gimlet has that sharp point, so it's going to go in right where you place that point and you'll get a really good positioning for your pilot hole. And there we go. That's going to look pretty good. All right, got the screws in. Now, I've got a little neoprene washer here, quarter inch. Going to put that over and put the knob on. Whoops. And there we go. And now we can set this at whatever level we want and that's going to hold that in position. So that's how our system is going to work to hold this at various heights. You know what? I love this thing. In its lowest position, it slides right in under the wing of my table saw and gives me some additional storage. I can raise it up part way and it becomes a great infeed table for my table saw. And that's going to be good because long boards or big pieces of plywood, I don't have to concentrate on holding the board up. I can concentrate on the cut. And I can raise it up even further in the position it's in now and it becomes a nice outfeed table for my bandsaw. And that's great because I don't have to worry anymore about work pieces dropping off the end of the bandsaw table. Overall, I think this thing is fantastic. One little hint, after I got the height situated for my table saw and for my bandsaw, I just used a Sharpie and marked a line around where it is next to the leg. That way, when I get ready to raise it, I can just raise each of the legs up to that mark and I'll know I'll be right on. And this level in the middle really helps me fine tune it and get it just right. The other thing that I can do is I can take the roller top off and put the plane top on and it becomes a nice little roll around workbench or even a bench to hold a bench top power tool. I might even uh, put my Lee dovetail jig on this when I use it. Well, all in all, it's been a great project. Of course, I've still got to make a couple of drawers here and a door for it, but you've seen that before. You can look at some of the other videos and see how I do that. If you want to build this, it's not a real hard project to do, but it will tax you a little bit when it comes to measuring accurately. It's just got to be perfect so that it all comes together correctly. But if you follow along in the videos, you'll get it done. I will, by the way, be uploading to my website some drawings and other information that will supplement what's in the videos and you're more than welcome to go to my website and download any of that information for free. As always, I really, really do appreciate you watching these videos. I appreciate you watching this series and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next project.